All right, so um, hello everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Department of English at The Ohio State University, uh, thank you so much for joining us for this English alumni panel. I'm Dr. Katie Stanitz. I am the undergraduate program manager in the Department of English and the moderator for this panel. Um, we're recording this webinar and we will share the video um, on our department YouTube page. So if you wanna rewatch, see us again, um, feel free to check us out there. Um, attendees, just so you know, you are muted and your video is off, so no worries about accidentally interrupting. Um, I'm really thrilled that everyone's joining us here today to um, hear from two of our fabulous alumni um, who are here to speak about their career paths. Um, as some of you know, the Department of English normally holds an annual alumni dinner and panel um, each autumn in which we gather to um, hear from a few Columbus area um, alumni. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, uh, we're not able to run this event as usual, so I can't see everybody's smiling faces in person. Um, but we've decided to use this setback and turn it into an opportunity. Um, since we aren't bound by location this year, we sought to connect with alumni who are outside of the immediate area, of which we have thousands. Um, and so I'm really pleased to just start by quickly introducing our two panelists, um, who are both from the New York City area. So first we have Jenna Jackson, who is the executive director of the Writers Guild Initiative, an in independent nonprofit 501c3 organization that is associated with the Writers Guild of America East. Since becoming part, a part of WGI, she has coordinated over 80 plus writing workshops and programs with uh, underserved communities, including veterans, caregivers of critically wounded veterans, immigrant youth, exonerated death row survivors, um, and the LGBTQ community, among others. She graduated from The Ohio State University in 2003 with a BA in English and African American and African Studies with a minor in theater. And she received her MFA in Dramatic Writing from the Tisch School of Arts at NYU. Currently based in Brooklyn, New York, Jenna is a writer, producer, and performer, having written several short films, plays, and monologues. Most recently, The Book of Ruth, performed in Michigan. We also have Elizabeth Kohanek, Associate Editor at Grand Central Publishing. Elizabeth graduated from The Ohio State University in 2012. After working at the Westerville Public Library for several years, she moved to New York and joined Grand Central Publishing in 2014. Since then, she has worked with New York Times bestselling authors like Min Jin Lee, David Paldacci, Bal I'm gonna screw that name up and I'm very sorry to that author, um, Sandra Brown, <laughs> Scott Turow, Harlan Coben, Nicholas Sparks, and more. Some of her recently published and upcoming titles are reissues of the award-winning novels of Octavia E. Butler, including the recent New York Times bestseller, Parable of the Sour, So We Can Glow and Mr. OK by award-winning author, Lessa Cross-Smith, and Nala's World by Dean Nicholson, creator of the One Bike, One World Instagram account. So thank you so much for both of you joining us today. We love to welcome all of our alumni back um, from the English department, and we especially love to hear what they've gone on to do since graduation. We always say that there's nothing that you can't do with an English major, but carving out an exact path and figuring out what you do want to do um, can be really, really daunting. That's why we're delighted to have our panelists here today to share their stories. Your journey might not look exactly like theirs, but we hope that they will inspire you to find your own specific path. We'll begin with each of our alumni speaking about their career paths and how they got from their OSU English BA to where they are today. Then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, I have some questions that were submitted ahead of time. Thank you all for those. Um, and we encourage attendees to submit questions here. Uh, to submit a question, please click the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and submit your comment or question. We may not be able to respond to every comment or question, um, but we'll do our best to address as many as possible. So thank you again to um, everyone attending here today, especially to our alumni panelists. Um, Jenna, if it's okay, I'd like to start with you. Sure, um, and thank you, Katie, for inviting me to do this panel. I'm super excited. Um, I just never thought that, you know, when I graduated from Ohio State and then getting to where I am now that I would have an opportunity to kind of give it back and kind of come full circle. So it's just been super exciting. So thank you so much. And also just having the opportunity to think through my journey from there to now has just been such a interesting thing to kind of process. So I really appreciate it. But um, hello, alumni. 
even though I can't really see you, but I know you're there and I appreciate it. I feel it in my heart. So <laughs> I appreciate you all coming and being a part of uh, watching this panel. Um, like Katie said, I graduated from the Ohio State University, you still have to say the D, <laughs> and I had a, with a BA in English and African American African Studies with a minor in theater. I was all about that classroom class life, which I appreciate it. Um, and then after I graduated, like many of you, I really had this thought about what did I want to do next? And like many of you sitting there, like if you don't know what it is that you want to do as soon as you graduate, that is completely okay. <laughs> because I had no idea of what I exactly I wanted to do with my English degree. And I could not have seen where I am now when I was there then. <laughs> so I'm just here to kind of give you a little bit of my journey of how I got here and hopefully it kind of helps and inspires you as well. So after I graduated, my, mo my first thought, my main thought was I need to get a job to pay these bills because bills are real and I need to eat and I need to be able to have a roof over my head and all that sort of stuff. So the first six months after I graduated, I was unemployed. I was basically doing the job hustle. I was going to websites and doing networking events and sending resumes and cover letters and all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that I did was I actually also reached back out to people that I had met at Ohio State. So mentors and professors and um, different people to say to them like, hey, I've graduated now. Like, if you know of anything, like, please let me know, um, you know, and of course, thank them for however they helped me while I was a student there at Ohio State. One of those particular people, one of the mentors, he was an advisor of mine. He had heard about a job that was opening in the colleges of the arts and sciences, and he just kind of let me know, like, there's a job opening. I think you'd be great at it. It's communication skills. It's writing. It's all these sort of things that, you know, hello, English degree perfect. So he was just like, I think you should apply for it. And I was like, bet I'm on it. So applied, interviewed, got the job. And the job was being an intake counselor for the College of the Arts and Sciences. So it's also like, oh, I'm coming back home. It's so great. Um, so basically, I got to do um, just a lot of front office sort of work. So it's like helping students add and drop classes, like helping them figure out how many major um, credits they needed, like if they wanted to switch majors, like all those sorts of uh, questions. So it was really about synthesizing a whole bunch of information and being able to give it to people and to communicate with all kinds of different people, which is very much within the wheelhouse of my English degree. So two things happened because I had that job. The first thing was that same advisor at the time, he was the director of the Arts and Sciences Diversity Services Office, which I don't think it's existing anymore. I think it's like the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and like undergraduate services sort of thing. But but at the time, he was the director there and he was, um, he was running a first year program. Um, and the person who was running it at the time was leaving to move out of state and they were getting ready to shut down this program. And something told me, now something is like my intuition, my gut, I'm also a woman of faith, so prayer, that sort of thing. But something told me like, if this, if this program gets shut down, like it's not, it's just never gonna come back. So the thought was, oh, they're gonna shut it down for a year because there's nobody there to run it. And then in a year's time or two years time, they're gonna find somebody to kind of take it back up again. But as we know in this world, a lot of times it's very easy for people to say no than to say yes. <laughs> so once something goes away, it's very hard for it to kind of come back. So while I was working this job, I, I just kind of volunteered myself and I said, hey, I know you don't have somebody available, but I can maybe try to kind of keep this thing going until you find someone, you know, is that something that you would want to do? And he said, of course. And, you know, he talked to my boss at the time. So for zero dollars, I actually started volunteering to kind of keep this program going. Um, and then while I was doing that, I kind of like it, I came in in kind of the middle of the year. So there was kind of all this other stuff that kind of had to clean up. And then at the end of the year, I literally kind of started thinking about like, what could this program be? So how could I be creative to think about ways to expand this program? And so then I went to him with my ideas and I was just like, I think it could do this and this and this and all this kind of stuff. And he was like, that's interesting. So then he like talked to my boss at the time. And then he was actually transitioning out to be a director of another um department and then the new director came in I was talking to her about it and then they came to me one day and they were and then they said how would you like a full-time job in the diversity services office running this particular program and I said yes <laughs> so so then I ended up um, becoming the program coordinator for the diversity services office and that 
first year program was the program for advising and scholarship and service, which is known as PASS. I don't know if any of you have been in that program, it's specifically for students of color. And that program is still there to this day. It's one of the proudest things that I was able to do as a staff at The Ohio State University is to give that opportunity to first year students. It was a great job. I loved it. It's so good that the person who replaced me is still doing that job. I was just like, dang, go on. <laughs> you know, on to greener pastures. This is kind of what it is. Um, so that was kind of one side of kind of how this first job kind of helped me to the next thing. The other thing, which was so cool, is if if you work at this college institution, you get to take classes for free. And you know me, I'm about that class life and I'm all about learning and growing. So I was just like, this is amazing. So what I ended up doing while I was working is I ended up taking kind of two classes. One of them was playwriting and the other one was screenwriting. And these were classes that I couldn't take while I was an undergrad because when was I gonna fit those in? on top of two majors and a minor. But <laughs> now that I was working, I was like, this is great. So I ended up taking a screenwriting, playwriting class and a screenwriting class, loved my screenwriting class. The professor there told me, he was like, hey, I think you, you know, I think you got something. I think you're kind of like really the things that you're writing, the work that you're writing, I am, I'm all about it. He was like, if you ever want to go to film school, like, let me know and I'll write you a recommendation letter, completely unsolicited. I had never heard of film school really before this. I didn't even really know what that was. And so he gave me a list of kind of the top 10 film schools and was like, let me know what you think. <laughs> so I so I kind of thought about it. I researched them, you know, and that sort of thing. And I was just like, and I'd already kind of thought that I would go back and get a master's degree in something, but, but that's the thing about English that's beautiful and also tricky. Like you can get a master's degree in anything when you have an English undergrad degree. But the hard thing is you can get a master's degree in anything when you have an English degree. So it's trying to figure out like what that means and what that looks like. So when he came to me with this opportunity, I was like, well, maybe. And so I thought about it and I was like, prayed about it. I was like, let me see if I can try to do this. So literally I applied to three graduate schools. I wasn't trying to apply everywhere because applications are expensive. Let's be real about it. And taking the GRE is a whole lot <laughs> so at least at, at that time. So I was like, I'm gonna do three schools. That's it. I applied to a school in Ohio. I applied to two in New York. Um, I got rejected from the school in Ohio go figure, <laughs> and yet got into NYU and Columbia University. So, so that is what precipitated me moving to New York City. Um, so here I am in New York City, loving my master's MFA life. And um, one of the things that happened while I was in school was things like this, like panels that would come through and people who were in various industries to say, here's what you can do with your MFA degree. Here's the industry. Here's this opportunity, that job opportunity, that sort of thing. And one of the things that happened was the executive director of the nonprofit that I work at now came in and she talked about how you can actually serve through writing and how you can actually help other people through writing, which I was like, that's intriguing. What does that even mean? So she talked about the programs that they had at the time and, and that sort of thing. And I was like, that's great. So I stayed behind. I talked to her for maybe five or 10 minutes. I got her business card and then promptly forgot her business card and went on with the rest of my life. <laughs> and so, and then a few, like a few months later, um, she actually said to the whole school that they had a part-time job opened at the, at the nonprofit. And I was like, oh, this is great. Like, this is my way in. I already kind of know her. This is going to be great. I applied for the job. I did not get the job. <laughs> My, my classmate ended up getting the job. I was like, you know what? It's okay. I'm not bitter. Enjoy your life. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> so, so then um, time goes on and this classmate, probably a good year afterwards, she kind of uh, texts me out of the blue. Now, I'm, I'm, we're friends with this classmate. We're cool, like that sort of thing, but we're not like best friends or whatever. But she texts me and she says like, hey, my job is doing this big gala fundraiser and we really need a volunteer. Like, can you like help us? Like that sort of thing. And I was just like, really? I'm <laughs> not sure. I don't know. But literally, like something told me, like, maybe you should go check this out. It's one, it's one night, it's one event. Consider it your good deed <laughs> for the week. Go and check it out and see what it is. So I go there, I help out with this gala, I meet the nonprofits board of directors, I meet all kinds of other people. You know, I'm like, okay, I think nothing of it at the time. I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. I talk to the executive director again you know, have a conversation with my classmate. They thank me profusely. I say, you're more than welcome. I go on with the rest of my life. <laughs> I graduate. And again, I'm in that similar situation of trying to figure out what's next, trying to in between jobs, hustling, figuring it out. Then about a week or so, maybe two weeks after the gala, the same classmate calls me and she says, 
I'm getting ready to move to LA. Like I got a job in LA, I'm, I'm moving to LA and we need someone to kind of come in really quickly to kind of pick up, you know, and do this part-time job. She was like, I was sitting in the office with my executive director and we kept thinking like, who's the person that we think would be perfect for this job? And we both said you <laughs> at the same time. And I was just like, strange, but okay. So, so she was like, I don't know if you're doing anything. Would you be willing to come in and interview for this position? I was like, sure. So I came in, I interviewed on like a Tuesday or Wednesday. They hired me on Monday and I was, and I started doing this job. Now I thought literally I was going to be at this job for six months. I was like, I'm gonna do this for six months. It's cool. Nonprofit stuff. Okay. Serving. I like it giving back to communities. That's great. Um, and that six months turned into a decade. <laughs> so literally, I've now been at this same organization for going on 10 years. Strangely enough, 10 months into my tenure there, the executive director resigned. So I literally had to learn how to completely keep this operation going almost by myself. And it was completely a learning curve. And that will take up the whole amount of time if I told you all of that story. But um, one of the things that I think I've learned from all of this process, and now as the executive director of this organization, which I am so proud of, and it's so amazing and being able to serve, like Katie read off all of the, some of the populations that we get to serve is that sense of being able to give back and have help other people to share their stories, which is English at its core is listening to stories, writing stories, being able to hear one another's stories, hold space for stories, dig into stories, love stories, and all those sorts of things. But I think one of the things that kind of was the guiding light to get me there was being able to say yes to things that were right in front of me. So like I couldn't have seen this. Like this was a little bit far-fetched. I didn't even know if I wanted to do nonprofit work. I wasn't even sure what that was. But being able to say yes to the thing that was right in front of me, saying yes to volunteering myself to help with this past program, saying yes to, you know, doing this job, saying yes to applying for film school, saying yes to those things. So as you, you do the one step at a time, as you say yes to one opportunity, the door for the next opportunity often will open up for you. And that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to say yes to everything all the time. I mean, some people do. And if that's what you want to do, that's great. That turned into burnout for me. So I had to learn not to do that. But I think it is that sense of when you see the thing that you are excited about, or you see the opening over there about something that interests you or that you're intrigued in, or, you know, the thing that you think is going to be like, oh, that'll be interesting. Saying yes to that can often lead you to places that you couldn't even possibly imagine. So that is kind of the nutshell of how I got here. I want to be like, thank you for listening to my TED talk. <laughs> And I will be around to answer any questions. So there it is. <laughs> That's awesome. I like, I feel so inspired. Like I want to go do, like I, I'm not a creative writer at all and I want to go to film school now. Um, I'm so excited. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and so, yes, we will definitely come back for Q and A. Um, I'm so excited. So yes, yeah, so now um, Elizabeth, um, so excited to hear from you as well. Oh, wow. I am so nervous to follow that. <laughs> I completely agree with what you were saying about saying yes to everything, which is um, why I said yes to this panel, even though public speaking is not my favorite. <laughs> but thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, like Katie said, I'm Elizabeth. I graduated from OSU in 2012, um, and I'm currently an associate editor at Grand Central Publishing, which is an imprint of Hachette, one of the big five publishing companies um, in New York. Uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit about my roadmap from OSU to publishing, as well as my current day-to-day -day at Grand Central. Um, when I was prepping for this panel, uh, it was actually kind of difficult to remember my exact path to publishing. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you kind of became English majors in the same way I did. I always loved to read and I just kept taking classes that let me read. And then an English major kind of just happened because I kept signing up for those classes. Uh, and if I'm being honest, like Jenna, I didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do. I just kept doing what I liked to do. Um, and when I'm thinking back to the exact moment when I started to move towards publishing, um, uh, and that seed was planted in my brain, and I hope that belabored metaphor doesn't make you lose all faith in me as an editor. Um, <laughs> but if I look back, I think it can be traced back to when I um, took Dr. Elizabeth Ranker's special topics in American literature class. Um, I actually enrolled in it at the very last minute to fill a scheduling gap 
um, and I did not check to see what that special topic was. Uh, it turned out to be a class on Moby Dick, uh, where we would read and analyze a few chapters each week, which was very daunting to me. Um, but at the time, it felt like kind of a lapse in judgment on my part, and it actually turned out to be kind of one of those weird moments of luck or fate or whatever, um, because, uh, well, first of all, the class was just really interesting and she was a brilliant professor. Uh, but one day she asked me if I'd like to apply to an editorial internship at a local lifestyle magazine in Columbus. Um, and before that point, I had always volunteered to edit my friends' essays and resumes for them because I just really liked editing. Um, but interning at that magazine was the first moment I kind of realized where like I had this, what I thought was a massively nerdy quirk in my personality, it could actually be a publishing career. Um, and after the internship in my magazine, uh, I looked to see if OSU offered any more publishing courses and I enrolled in one my senior year, which was a great kind of first window into the industry. Um, from there, after I graduated, it was kind of a winding road to actually get my foot in the door to publishing, uh, which is partly why I did this panel. Um, I know it's a really tough industry to break into, and it kind of lacks transparency. A lot of my friends, when they're when they're writing books or, or, or want to get an agent or something, they they just don't really know. So sorry, there's a police loudspeaker outside my apartment. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they, they just don't really know a lot about publishing and about the process that goes into it. Um, and I know it's intimidating to start applying because there always seems to be this endless supply of super passionate and qualified English majors like you guys um, who are eager to be editors. Um, and if you're not in New York, um, you, you might feel like you're at a disadvantage. Um, and that was my case. Um, I always kept an eye on entry level positions and internships, but I hardly ever heard back because I wasn't living in New York at the time, um, or at least that's what I tell myself. Maybe there was just something wrong with my resume. Um, but instead, I pretty much took every opportunity that I could to get experience in the book industry period even if it was only tangentially, tangentially related to publishing. So I interned at a bookstore um, and then I worked at Westerville Public Library for a couple of years. And both those ended up being really great opportunities to kind of look at the book industry from a consumer's perspective and become more familiar with a lot of the big commercial authors that are always on the bestseller list. And I think that's like one example of something that felt like a setback at the time. Um, Felt like my life was kind of on hold and I wasn't doing exactly what I wanted to do. But then when I finally started inter interviewing, I had experience working at a library and I had um, kind of knowledge of some of the authors like Nicholas Sparks and David Baldacci and Sandra Brown, who I hadn't read personally as a reader before um, I started working at that library. Um, so I was at the library and then I finally found out about, um, and I was applying to a lot of places and getting rejected from literally unpaid internships. Um, and then I finally found out about the summer publishing programs at Columbia in New York, um, which are both six week crash courses in publishing. And I applied to both. I ended up um, attending the Columbia publishing course, uh, which was a truly intense experience. Um, it was six weeks divided into three weeks for book publishing and three weeks for magazines. Um, and each day we had two to three speakers who worked in various areas of book and magazine publishing um, from editorial to art to marketing and publicity and sales and contracts. Um, it was a great way to get that crash course in what publishing actually entails. Um, and also learn a little bit more about not an editor jobs in publishing. Uh, if you're interested in publishing and maybe don't want to be an editor, there are so many more jobs in publishing that you could do. Um, and you just don't hear about them as much. Um, and then of course we had a worksheet in the a workshop in the final week of each part of the course uh, where you would uh, pretend to have your own publishing company or magazine um, and you would get advice from real professionals in the industry. Um, and when the program was done, I uh, moved to New York in late August, um, got an internship, um, and then eventually a, a full-time job as an editorial assistant at Grand Central, where I currently am still uh, in November. Um, and actually, it's interesting because a lot of the um, a, a big draw of the Columbia Publishing pr Program is that they place a big emphasis on job placement afterwards. And the director of that course really was great about reaching out to me and like um, letting me know if there were positions open and helping me prep for interviews. But I actually ended up um, getting both of those jobs through friends I made from the program, um, which is 
something that I'll learn again and again in publishing. It is a very small industry. And I think in life in general, be nice to everyone you meet um, because you never know who will be, will have this great opportunity for you later or think of you for a position or help you in some way. Um, so I'm really grateful for that course. Um, it definitely helped me get a foot in the door and was a great experience for me. Um, I will say that expensive publishing programs aren't an option for everyone. And it, is not the only way in. Um, a lot has changed in 2020, obviously. Um, we're all working from home now, um, which means you know we all kind of know that these jobs can be remote now. Um, and both as a result of that, and also just our industry-wide efforts to make publishing a more diverse workforce, I think there are gonna be a lot more opportunities going forward for remote internship opportunities. Um, so I would just, if I were you, if you're interested in publishing, I would keep an eye on industry news, um, maybe sign up for publishers weekly newsletter um, and kind of see what opportunities crop up that might make it more accessible so you don't have to like move to New York um, or go anywhere in a pandemic. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, so now I'll talk a little bit about my um, kind of career path and day-to-day -day experience at Grand Central. Um, uh, so the editorial path specifically in publishing is kind of oriented around mentorship. You start as an editorial assistant, which I did. Um, I assisted Grand Central's um, editor-in-chief of the hardcover list, and I helped her manage her full list of titles, um, all of which were at different points in their life cycles, um, as well as reading submissions for her that came to her from literary agents to try to figure out um, what books might be viable for publishing. Um, and a good, good fit for Grand Central's list. Um, I started to develop my own agent contacts. Also, I would take, um, uh, a lot of times I would take the agent's assistants out for drinks um, or coffee or something like that. And, and we would kind of start to grow up together in the industry. Um, and then eventually, you know, agents started submitting things to me instead of my boss. Um, and that's kind of started how, how I started climbing up the ladder and eventually acquired my own titles. Um, I currently um, work with the publisher closely on his titles, as well as kind of building my own list at the same time, which is generally what happens. Um, you'll first have none of your own titles, then you'll have some, um, and then you'll kind of like wean yourself away from, um, from other editors and co-editing and have your own full list. Um, so it's kind of nice because you draw on the experience that you get co-editing titles with your bosses um, and, and you don't feel so lost when you start to do your own. Um, so it's kind of hard to describe my day to day because I'm managing a lot of different titles at different points in their life cycles. So instead, I thought I would kind of walk you through the life cycle of a single title. Um, so first, a literary agent will, um, you know, as, as discussed, um, you know, you're making your agent uh, contacts and eventually an agent will submit a manuscript for you, to you that you really want to acquire. Um, at that point, you'll do a profit and loss statement, um, kind of uh, gauging from, from similar titles on the market, how you think it will sell and how many copies you think it will sell. Uh, and you'll take it to your company's acquisition board. Um, and that'll include people from sales, publicity, and marketing, and they'll all weigh in and hopefully clear you to make an offer. Uh, and then if you make an offer to the agent who runs by the author and hopefully accepts, uh, then you will acquire the title for your company and the life cycle actually begins. Uh, and then there are a whole slew of things that need to happen. Of course, you edit the book, you go back and forth uh, with the author on those edits. Um, but you also need to think about a lot of other things. You, you think about the book's interior design and cover, and you kind of are the advocate for the book within your company. Like, you know, when I um, when I when I think about a book, um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll think about both what market we want to reach um, and what reader we, we want to reach and also what covers are already out there and how we can kind of be in that same vein and also make it stand out. Um, uh, you'll also want to pitch, you'll eventually pitch the book to your sales team and your sales team are the people who are selling the book in, to bookstores. Um, you'll be working closely with Mark and publicity teams. Um, you'll write descriptive copy for the flaps in the back cover. You might write a reading group guide. Um, you know, it's this huge coordinated team effort. Um, and editorial is kind of the pin connecting all these different players, like uh, the author and the agent, marketing and publicity. Um, so it's a really interesting and, and, and ever-changing and demanding job. Um, I honestly usually don't have a lot of time to read or edit during the day, which is what most people think I do when I tell them about my job. I do that a lot nights and weekends. Um, usually I start the day with a solid to-do list of like 
like today I was going to write copy for David Baldacci's new book and that's not done because emails happened. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting job and, um, and, and I enjoy it because it feels like you're constantly learning. Um, the marketplace is always changing, publishing is always changing. Um, you're always kind of looking for new opportunities and new authors with new stories to tell. Um, and even though it is a lot of work, um, there is literally no better feeling than when something cool happens for one of your authors um, and you get to tell them and they are so happy and you feel like you have been a part of bringing that into the world. Um, it's really exciting. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. I always think it's so interesting to hear, like you said, kind of the like nuts and bolts of like what we think, you know, kind of what people think uh, a job looks like and then what it is. And I also think that it is a truth that all jobs are more email than you ever think they would be. <laughs> it is like 90% email. <laughs> never ending. It's never ending the email. <laughs> Yes, I always say that sometimes I look at my calendar and I think, oh, I have a ton of time for this, you know, big, exciting, like juicy project. And then I'm like, oh, wait, no, that's that's email time. Um, so, yes. Uh, so email is the it's like death tax, taxes and email, um, I think, is what it means to be a modern day professional. Uh, thank you both so much. This is just so informative. Um, and so um, I have some questions. And again, uh, all of you attendees, please feel free to use the Q&A to submit any questions if you have them. Um, but we do have some questions already submitted. And so um, one of the questions that I've always thought um, is, is a great question is um, kind of, have you faced any roadblocks or difficulties um, in your pursuit of your degree or your career? Um, and how did you kind of um, overcome them or work through them or like approach them? Because um, I think that's something that a lot of students um, face or think about, you know, kind of what happens when you might get stuck a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is a roadblock necessarily, but I mean, I would be dishonest if I did not warn you that publishing is a slow, a slow career to, to it's slow career growth so like mm -hmm. you are going to be working at least in editorial at pretty low pay for a long time um and it is it, it it's not hard at first and especially like when you're a recent college grad like everyone told me this and I was like it's cool like I love books um and that will sustain me <laughs> and it has somewhat but also like you know, you're five years in and, you know, you, you're still like assisting some people, but have your own titles and it's a lot of work and lot, not a lot of pay. And I think like finding the the kind of fortitude to keep going um, is, is a struggle. Um, yeah, honestly, I think for me, it's helped to see that the way things work generally in for editor, editorial at least, is that you are overwhelmed until suddenly you inherit a bunch of titles and get promoted. <laughs> and like, there tends to be like, kind of like, you are plateauing, plateauing with like a ton of work and you feel a little overwhelmed. And then all of a sudden you get promoted and you're like, oh yes, okay. <laughs> like, so, so seeing like several other um, associate editors make it quickly up to like editor and then senior editor and 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 you know these are people who I really respect and like and you know we go out for coffee and they kind of mentor me that has been really helpful to kind of see other people make it <laughs> wow I'm Elizabeth that's such a good point like I had I was trying to also think of a roadblock but like low pay and long hours yes <laughs> that is also true in the nonprofit world <laughs> like depending on what organization you're in it you know it takes a while in order to actually make income that is sustainable for it for like your life um I, the other roadblock that I think is similar thing of being like I didn't wake up one morning and become the executive director like I had to hustle and I had to work and like I said like when our uh, when the previous executive director resigned like I literally was the only full-time person and I had to learn everything kind of as as I was going and and there had it hit a moment where I wanted the executive director title and I asked for it and I did not get it and so I had to figure out either is this the moment where I say that this job is actually not for me and I need to leave this organization or is this the moment where I need to figure out why they're saying no and is there something else that I could do to make them say yes so I thought the latter <laughs> and so I you know, repitched it. I really thought through like what what were their hesitations and kind of what were their fears about it. And I literally worked hard to to assure them that like I I am not this. I am you know and 
whatever concerns that they may have had about me becoming that, I, I really worked hard to make sure that those concerns weren't valid, basically. Mm-hmm. And over time, they actually agreed with me and they, and they gave me the position. So, so it's definitely a roadblock when you hear a no for something that you feel like is an automatic yes um, mm-hmm. and learning how to self-advocate so that you do get to the yes that you feel like you, you know is true and the one that you deserve. So, yeah. That's such a good point. Yeah, I, 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 you literally just made me remember like one of the first things I had to learn to do was like when I felt overwhelmed, actually advocate for myself. And it's like hard when you feel lucky to have made it in it like into an industry or made it into a job that you really wanted and then being like okay but I'm grateful for this but also like I'm not being paid enough or I I have grown out of this role and I just more now yeah that's really hard so true yeah and that's such an important uh thing so thank you for yes and I also uh really appreciate what both of you said too about kind of saying yes to opportunities and you know um like really thinking about kind of I think what Jenna said about like going after what you want like figuring out what you want and like really kind of taking those opportunities um so I have a question that kind of like one for each of you basically um and so um so Jenna I was I I think like we have a lot of creative writing students or students who are really interested in creative writing and so um like I'm so interested in like your kind of you know, creative background, like your MFA, but also like the um, writing that you do and the, you know, the films and the play and everything like that. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more kind of about like your creative writing and like, and, and your creative work and kind of how um, like that factors into not just, you know, your career, but like your life and, and how you continue doing that type of work. Sure, sure. I'm like, oh, here's the fun part. <laughs> because I have, I have been creative and a writer forever it feels like um I can remember writing like my first book when I was seven it was the bear in the big blue house I actually still remember the title of it and so um so yeah I feel like I've always been passionate about being artistic being creative writing all of those sorts of things and I can just remember that being encouraged kind of in my life along the way it's probably the thing that pushed me into doing the English degree because I started off as a computer and information science major true story and um really loved technology technology and and computers and all that kind of stuff but just all the other classes to get to that was just a whole lot (laughs) and but I was super passionate about the arts and story and literature and things like that so I feel like I've just been able to um, nurture that and continually write Um, so I started off kind of doing short stories. And then I had a big stint where I was, where I did poetry. I loved poetry. I used to do performance poetry and slam poetry and, and stuff like that. Um, and then while, while all of that was happening and I was in my English degree, I had that moment where I was like, okay, so what do you actually want to you know, pursue as a master's degree? And I thought, you know, I can either do academia and education or maybe I will do this artistic thing. And I think it was that teacher, my screenwriting teacher who said, you know, it's that one person who's like, I think you got something, you know, and I think, I think, you know, other people would want to hear what you have to say that I was like, all right, let's give it a whirl. See if he's right. And being able to, and the thing about screenwriting that I love so much, because I loved literature, I loved books, I loved reading. I think it was screenwriting gives you the ability to do the extra step that books don't always get help you to do. So like books, you get to create the whole world in your mind and that's amazing. Screenwriting gives you the ability to for other people to see the world that's actually in your mind and be able to write it down so that other people can join with you in it. And I was just like, that's amazing. <laughs> so, so I um, got my M- MFA in screenwriting and did screenwriting and television writing and plays and, and all of that kind of stuff. And I think I just, I love that collective storytelling. I love being able to have other people see a world that either is just like theirs, but in a different perspective or see a world that they have never seen before and be able to still connect with it and be like, oh, that is actually something that I experienced. That is actually my story. That is me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, and I think just through that whole process has just been just wonderful. And I try to cultivate it and still cultivate it. It's hard being an mm-hmm. ED and still t- trying to, you know, nurture my artistic side. So I try to do what I tell people all the time. So one of my programs is literally teaching people how to write. So the thing I tell people all the time is like, even if you just write for 15 minutes a day, like it is worth it and you will make progress. So I always have to when I tell them have to follow my own <laughs> advice because sometimes it's hard to follow your own advice. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's it's the thing that that grounds me the most and it balances me and it's, you know, and I'm hoping like I've had 
a little bit of things here and there. I'm hoping to do more things in the future so that I can continually, you know, grow that side of me as well as continually do my full-time work. So it's hard, but it's, it's definitely worth it. <laughs> That's awesome. And, you know, I think just yeah, like how those two things come together in some ways, but it's also finding the space to do it too. That's, that's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, so Elizabeth, I know um, you kind of answered a little bit of this before, but I was curious, we have a lot of students who are interested in the publishing industry. And so um, you kind of uh, said a little bit about this before, but I was wondering if you could expand a bit about kind of students who are interested in breaking into that um, kind of sector and like what you would um, recommend to them in terms of that, like, of you know, you mentioned setting up, I think, for Publishers Weekly, um, and, you know, but if there, you have other tips for students who are interested in that um, and opportunities in that area. Yeah, definitely. There's always more you can do. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely keep an eye out for internships, remote internships, especially. I think there will be a lot more of, um, you know, mm -hmm. keep an eye out. There are five big publishing companies in New York. Um, so maybe look those up, keep an eye on their websites, keep an eye for any opportunities they have. Literary agencies are also a really good way to go. Um, a lot of people um, get an internship at a literary agency to start and either a, realize that they really love agenting, um, which is another side of publishing. I feel like doesn't get as much attention, um, but it's a great career path. Um, or they'll make their way um, to a publishing house from there. Um, I would also read books on the bestseller list and celebrity book clubs especially are kind of a big pusher nowadays. Like um, there are a lot of influencers and I feel like um, as an English major, I took a lot of, I mean, this was my own choice, but I feel like I took a lot of like classes focused on the classics and like I don't know I was reading a lot of Shakespeare but I did not read a lot of the big commercial authors that I now currently work on um and I work on more literary stuff too but I just think it's really good to kind of keep an eye on on what's what, what's popular right now and what's really moving moving sales um so yeah take a look at the New York Times bestseller list um Reese Witherspoon's book club those books are doing so well um Jenna Bush's book club um yeah I would just try to especially now while we're in quarantine, try to read a lot. And then when you go into interviews, like, like I said, there are a lot of qualified people, but if you can talk about, you know, recent books that have been really, um, really making waves and talk intelligently about those, you're going to stand out from the crowd a little bit. Um, and yeah, I would definitely sign up for the Publishers Weekly um, newsletter just because it's a great way to keep an eye on what's going on in, in the industry. And maybe you'll see an opportunity and jump on it and other people who are just checking like indeed.com are not going to see that. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's more, but I think those are good steps. Um, and there always are those summer publishing programs after we're out of this situation, um, which for me was a really good last ditch thing to get me to New York. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, we just had a question in the Q&A and it was a question that also had been kind of submitted before. I'm going to slightly amend it. Um, people are interested in um, kind of what minors or even even career like or different degree programs that you might pair with English um, or if there are kind of other experiences. Um, so I'm kind of merging a few questions together basically, but are there different um, types of minors that you think would be um, good for the areas that you work in? Um, so both of you or um, other types of degree programs or um, extracurricular internship things that you think would be important for students to really think about? Um, I wish I'd taken a business class. <laughs> publishing is a business and I should have taken some business classes um, and also I feel like I don't know Jenna you said you used to be like a computer a computer computer science, yeah, computer science yeah. <laughs> I wish I'd done some stuff like that like, I feel like I I followed my heart a little too much and now I wish I had some more practical skills and knowledge <laughs> yeah I don't know if there's um similar I don't know if there's like a particular minor for what I do right now but definitely like accounting stuff because there's a lot more business you know uh, mathematical things like balancing a budget that sort of thing like if you can have classes that can teach you how to do those sorts of things or even just some hands-on internship skills where you can do stuff like that that is definitely helpful um, and all kinds of just any ways that you can flex leadership and managing people I think is is definitely helpful like so whatever if you're in student organizations if you're you know in different groups like that that can really help you to kind of sharpen those skills about yourself and be able to speak in front of people and lead stuff and having to work in group settings and work with different people I think all of that is helpful yeah absolutely um 
And so kind of a um, similar question, um, and actually I think the original question, or one of the original versions of this question was, is a computer science minor uh, a good idea? And so apparently it is. So thank you. So that was actually, that worked out. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things I think our students are always interested in is how they can stand out to employers, kind of especially coming out of undergrad or things that they can do maybe um, and how they're articulating like their skills and what they um, have gotten out of that and how they can how they can potentially stand out to people. Yeah, I feel like the thing that I always remember is what makes you you um, because there are hundreds of thousands of English um, degree you know, people who have English degrees, but I think it's the thing, it reminds me very much of, you know, my thought about writing, like a character is a character because of the things that they do, the things that they're passionate about, the things that, you know, the even something as simple as the way that they say no is different than the way other people would say no, because that's the way that the character is. And so I feel like for, for, for you personally, like what is the thing that really makes you, you? Like anyone could have done an English major and many people have done English majors, but why did you do this English major? What is particular about you that you, like love about it or gravitate towards or you're passionate about and then and I think something that is very true there was a season kind of in the mid 2010s when everyone was kind of like we want to hear the story about an organization we want to hear a story about like how this thing is changing the world we want to hear the story and I think that's still true like I feel like what is your story like what is the thing that is you like if you love comic books if you you know did a recital when you were 15 if you've hiked up Mount Everest like it as much as that seems like very random when you're talking about like interviewing for positions but people remember that stuff like I remember you know interviewing like people looking for internships and it was the small details that they told me that really made them not just the facts on the sheet of paper but made them a person that I, that have interest and skills and you know done interesting things or things that they are quirky or passionate about those are the things that you actually remember because it makes them the person not just what's happening on the sheet of paper so I feel like the way in which you can articulate them more of like this is who I am and this is the things that I love and this is why I want this job because it connects to this thing that I'm passionate about or this thing that I want to do or this thing that I'm curious about and I have no idea about it but I feel like your job will help me to think through some of those things mm -hmm. I think that is the way that you can really help to stand out. Mm -hmm. I don't have too much time because you're the expert in this part, uh, <laughs> but I would say just for publishing, uh, do your research on the company and what books they published and have something specific to say about it because it's really obvious when someone like is familiar with your company or is just just has like a generic letter for everyone. Yeah, that's true too. Please ask questions. Ask good questions in the in the interview <laughs> process. Ask, not just like what the salary is or like what are the benefits package, but really ask them a question about the about the job that you, that really will affect whether or not you want to actually do it. Besides, I just want this job. Like you know what I mean. So that really does make you stand out. Also, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, we have a few, uh, I have a question again, I think for kind of um, one for each of you. Um, and so Elizabeth, we have a question in the Q&A about, um, actually both of you can answer this one too, but more about um, kind of working abroad and um, opportunities in, in your fields to work abroad, um, if you know anything about that or not. Um, I know we have some students who are kind of interested in, uh, you know, we have study abroad, which obviously right now is a little bit on hold, um, but you know, kind of in the future, if, um, you've ever considered that or opportunities that you might know of in terms of making that transition? I know that I'm not gonna have all the information off the top of my head, but we do have a bridges program. Um, so like we have a branch of Peshat in the UK mm -hmm. um, and we sometimes publish books together. And then there is like an editor exchange program where you can go and stay in the UK for a while and see our UK offices. Um, I don't know that it's like an extended thing, but we do have branches in like, we have Pesha Australia, we have, um, I think we have, yeah, Spain, um, UK. So I, I think it's possible. I don't know, I've never looked into it myself for the, for the practical details and how feasible it is, but I think there are opportunities like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the UK is easiest if you don't speak another language, but. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, yes. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, and so, um, Jenna, so Elizabeth talks a little bit about kind of the life cycle and like day-to-day -day things. And so, um, and we know about the voluminous emails um, that all of us have, but um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of like what like a day-to-day -day, or like kind of what an average like week or things that you do like as the executive director um, of the Writers Guild um, initiative. And so um, I think just um, Initiative Institute, Initiative, okay, I got it right. Um, so, sorry, I was like, oh no, if I got this wrong. Um, but so kind of what like that looks like kind of on a day-to-day -day almost. Sure, the day-to-day, -to -day, um, it can it can change from day-to-day, -day, which is one of the things that I like about the job that is also can be a little bit hard about the job. But I think it's a lot of managing people and it's about managing programs and it's making sure that things kind of keep moving. Now, all of this has kind of been upended and changed since now we're in the midst of the pandemic and working from home. But I think it's a lot about one, it's about making sure that the programs that we're doing are actually happening and running smoothly. If there's any kind of issues that are happening, if there's people that I need to connect to, whether that's partners that we're doing the programs with to see what do they need, like what's going on, as well as connecting with our participants. Um, I have a, I have a, our director of communications, so she's very much about the content and kind of the forward facing uh, that we do for our organization. So she runs our social media, she's there for our website, so it's connecting with her on a regular basis to just see what content is going out there, what content can we create, like who are the people that we need to reach out to. Um, and then a lot of the back end stuff about whether it's emails, whether it's balancing budgets, so you know, all these things cost money, nonprofits, and a lot of, and also working with, um, we have a fund, a fund developer, grant developer person. So there, she's the one who kind of helps to write some of our grants so that we get federal funding and funding from different foundations and organizations. So it's a check in with her, like, what are the grants that are out there right now? What sort of information do you need? Um, you know, and then it's the coordination of um, the actual program. So, so I am there, you know, when we have our writing workshops, I am there to like greet the participants. I've mentored several times, you know, Know. so it's kind of all of that so any any particular day I could be balancing a budget one day I could be talking to a partner the next day I could be making sure participants have what they need the next day so it's kind of rotating kind of those things in and out and making sure kind of everything all the plates keep spinning as I like to say <laughs> yeah no, that, yeah, I know exactly what you mean about keeping the plates spinning. So, yes, no, that sounds so interesting, though. And I think, like, that's, I love, like, jobs and a work that allows you to kind of do so many different things. And I think, like, English majors are so kind of well set up to, like, have that given the kind of flexibility and adaptability that comes into that. And so that's, that's wonderful. Um, one of the questions I think that our students, um, I'm going to kind of fold a question that we got um, into this, but um, I think is part of a large and make it part of a larger question. But um, one of the questions we got was kind of essentially for Elizabeth, like, what does an editor do? Like, in the sense of like, um, like, do you go in and like edit and revise and do that? Is it like a, like, is it collaborative? Like how, like kind of what I guess authority does an editor have in that way? Um, so, which I think is an interesting, as soon as the person kind of framed it, I was like, oh, I guess I don't actually know what that is either. Um, and so I think that would be great to kind of hear about. Um, but also I'd love to hear both of you talk a little bit about networking too. And so Elizabeth, you said a little bit about kind of, you know, taking people out for coffee and kind of and drinks and stuff like that. But I think our students are always kind of looking for like, like, how do you network? Like, it's like you hear like, oh, like you should network. And then it's kind of like, well, what is that? Like, how does that work? <laughs> and so, so again, sort of two questions kind of prom I, I pronged questions there basically. Yeah, don't let me forget about the second question. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, that's a, yeah, that's a good question about editing because I feel like I didn't even have the best idea of what an editor, like, I, I knew how to edit, I'd edited friends things, I, I'd done the internship at the magazine, um, but I remember when my boss, like I, I was like, it was like my first month working there or something, and a lot of times your first experience editing, it'll be like, your boss has a manuscript and they're like, oh, do you wanna edit this for me? And so you, you, you take it and then give them your edits and then they kind of fold whatever they wanna take into theirs. And I remember like obsessing over commas and typos, which is not what an editor does at all. Um, so an editor, like it's a combination of big picture editing and line editing. Um, you know, a copy editor will not necessarily make changes at a, at a sentence level besides like correcting a wrong word choice or, or a typo or a comma or something grammatical. So, um, you know, I do do a 
fair amount of line editing where I'm trying to make everything as clear as possible um, and flow nicely. And then of course there's like, and of course like striking paragraphs or, you know, suggesting they expand on something. And then there's also the big picture editing of like, I feel like this character development is not making sense to me. Like this is rushed. This is, you know, talking about motivations and plot twists and, you know, swapping chapters or whatever, you know, that kind of big picture stuff. Um, I do, I, different editors are different, um, but I always tell them that this is their world in the words of Bob Ross. And like, these are just my suggestions. Um, if I found something seriously concerning or problematic on like a moral level, I, I, would, I would take a hard stance on that. Um, luckily that hasn't happened really, um, but it's always in the back of my mind where I'm like, okay, there are certain lines that I really need to be like, no, we need to take this out. But luckily, like it is very much like a conversation and I suggest something and say, this is what I think. And usually authors are, are just the best people and, and, and they'll be really receptive to feedback. And sometimes they say like, no, this is, this is what I think about this character. And like, I, I don't want to take this out of it. And that's completely fine. Um, so yeah, it's a conversation and it's a really um, collaborative process. Uh, yeah, and then uh, for networking, I hope that answered the question. Let me know if it didn't. <laughs> and then for networking, um, yeah, it is kind of an intimidating thing. I think right now um, at, at your stage of you know being um, you know in college, you can always reach out for, to people in link, on LinkedIn for informational interviews. I've had college students do that to me, and I always try to respond and like take 10 minutes to do a phone call or something, because I think everyone everyone who has a job remembers what it was like to be in college and not have a job. So I think you'll, you know, if you say, hey, do you mind if I take 10 minutes of your time and ask you some questions about your company? Like, probably most people will make time for you or maybe even refer you to someone else and like you never know what will come of something like that um you, you know maybe they'll have an internship opportunity or maybe they'll have a colleague who needs an assistant or whatever um so yeah I would just like like Jenna was saying earlier say yes to everything reach out to everyone um make friends with everyone <laughs> and be nice and you'll never know what what will come of something and and yeah <laughs> Yeah, I agree. <laughs> like reach out, make friends. Um, I think also it's helpful if you're networking to know why you want to network and connect with this industry. Either it's a person, it's a company, you know, that sort of thing. Like, what is it that you really want to know from them? Because I think also in the midst of, you know, if you're trying to reach, you know, an editor or a CEO or something like that, like, their time is a lot and they have a lot to go through. Again, all those emails. So it's, so as clear as you can be like, hey, I really wanna, I'm interested in your company because of ABC, I would be great if you could give me 10 minutes to answer these couple things. That's great, that's clear, they know like what it is. Um, and I think networking is important because again, you just never know, like Elizabeth said, you just never know who you're gonna meet. And I think as for our industries and also for my creative industry of like filmmaking and playwriting and all that other stuff, like you just never know, like one conversation with one person can turn into all kinds of things. You know, someone who's a PA, like a pr production assistant on one job ends up being a showrunner of another show. And, you know, all those connections can happen so quickly. And I think even for this, I mean, another silver lining of the pandemic is that people are, kind of a little bit more accessible than they normally would be because we're kind of all in it together. So I feel like that's a great opportunity to kind of use that to be able to reach out to strategic people and, and kind of just hear from them, ask them questions, you know, let them know what you're doing. I think that's also helpful. So not just, it doesn't feel like they're just giving to you, but you can also say, here's something that I'm doing and interested in so that they have something to take with them just in, in the back of their mind. So if they're somewhere or talking to someone else, be like, oh, I did just hear from a student about this, this, and this, like, you know what I mean? Giving them something also to, to hold on to is good too. Awesome, that, yeah, I think that's really good. And so students, yes, please do reach out to people. Um, you know, not everybody is scary. And in fact, most of us are pretty nice. Um, so <laughs> I think that's super important to remember. And I think it means a lot to you coming from our alumni because, you know, you guys are out there and, you know, receiving these kinds of things. So thank you so much. Um, so I guess if you wouldn't mind, just kind of one last question uh, would be, I think like um, for graduating seniors, you know, so for both kind of, um, our students who are graduating this autumn, but also, you know, for students um, who might be graduating in spring 2021, um, I guess kind of what advice uh, would you give them, like students kind of going out 
uh, into the world for their first kind of um, jobs and things like that. Things to think about, things to, you know, kind of reflecting back what you might have wanted someone to tell you when you were graduating. I mean, I have one thing. I mean, <laughs> um, to expand on some of the things we've talked touched on a little bit, um, you know, about saying yes to opportunities and being nice to everyone and networking. Um, I guess like the thing that I would have wanted to be told, and I feel like this will ring especially true now, is like, don't worry about feeling like you're behind other people because everyone is on their own journey. And like two years might feel like it was two years before I before I like got a foot in the door for publishing. And it felt like such a long time. And I felt like other people were doing their jobs and, and starting things and, and I was falling behind. And then I was in a new city and I was older than some other assistants who were starting, but like it all, everyone like ends up in a similar place. Like don't worry about it, don't be hard on yourself. And also it's a pandemic right now and you have a very good excuse. If you don't find something right away, like people are gonna be cool about it. So try not to be hard about on yourselves. <laughs> Yeah, I had same thoughts. Like there's still times even now that I'm like, am I behind? Like what's, what is happening in my life? But I'm not, it is all fine. Um, and I think just to echo what Elizabeth is saying, like I, I wish somebody would have told me like, you are gonna find your way like you are. And it's, and it's okay if you don't find your way in the first 30 days like, or the first two months or even in the first year. Like if, if you really are thinking about it and being intentional about it. And even if there's days when you are not and you are just like, Again, we are in the midst of a pandemic where you can eat ice cream for breakfast and no one's gonna care because we're in the midst of a pandemic. So, so it's okay if you take some time to also do self-care in the midst of trying to figure all of this out. And if you don't know in the first, you know, few months, if you don't know in the first year, like it is, it is completely okay, or two years, whatever it is, like your process is your process and trusting the fact that because you as long as you stay on the journey like you're going to figure it out it is going to come together you are going to get to the places that you want to get to um it may be longer or it may be a little bit more you know stuff in there that you didn't expect but that's okay like that's just a part of life but you really you really are going to make it, it and it is going to be amazing when you get to do this <laughs> like and you get to do this for other people who are sitting right where you're sitting right now because like i said i didn't expect to do this and here i am getting able to share it with you so it really so surreal. <laughs> <laughs> also, I was very intimidated when I looked at your resume on LinkedIn before this panel. So, <laughs> yeah, you've done so much. <laughs> I'm, well, Elizabeth, I was looking at yours and I was just like, oh my gosh, she's an editor. That's so amazing. Can I tell her about a book I want to do. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Send it my way. <laughs> I'm so excited. Like that's the other position. That's the other job that I thought I was going to do. Like, because I'm a proofreading nerd. Like I love proofreading and editing love stuff. Proofreading was, is so calming. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. Like people give me stuff to proofread all the time. <laughs> They're just like, check my thesis. Like all this other stuff. <laughs> <It's crazy. laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> this, is <laughs> nice to meet you. this has just been so amazing. I, um, I wish we could just go on and on and on. And I wish I could bring you both to Columbus when it is safe to bring it to come to Columbus. And so we'll have to, you know, stay in touch and everything like that. But thank you so much. We need the dinner. <laughs> we need the actual yes. food. <laughs> yes, we'll, have, we'll do part two. We'll do part two when it's safe again. Um, but this has been so thrilling. Thank you both so much, so, so much um, for coming here to talk to us this evening and our, you know, our students and to have the recording for this for our students. It's just, it's an absolute, like this is um, like such a thrill for me. I know it's a thrill for them. I really, really appreciate um, both of you being here. We're getting people saying thank you in the um, Q and A too. Um, <laughs> so uh, this has just been great. I, um, and just to learn from both of you and to have both of you come back um, really from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you.